So good morning. good morning. Thank you. Awesome. So welcome. I'm so excited to be here with you all today. And I'm here to share a practice called mindfulness. Now, the biggest thing about mindfulness is that it is an experience. Kind of like playing an instrument or playing a sport. You kind of have to do the thing to get it. You know, it's one thing to talk about, this is how you play a guitar, this is how you do a chord, and how you strum, and this is how you hit a baseball. Well, same thing with mindfulness. We don't just want to talk about it, we want to actually do it. So set down anything that's in your hand, and you're going to humor me for the next few minutes. <laughs> so we're going to close our eyes to do this exercise, and the real reason why we want to close our eyes is just to eliminate distractions. You guys remember that, uh, what was it, a Disney movie or Pixar Up, that dog, it's like squirrel, shiny things, right? That's us, or at least that's me, I should just speak for myself, right? So when we close our eyes, we're just a little bit more focused on what we're doing, yeah? Okay, so I'm gonna lead you through an exercise. You're in my capable hands. <laughs> so close your eyes, and I want you to begin by doing a check-in. A little check-in with your mind. So I want you to just notice what thoughts might be present here in your mind right now. What are you thinking about? And specifically, what are you thinking about that's going to distract you from paying attention to me? So just notice those thoughts that are there. Take a nice big breath in through your nose and let it out. <sighs> yeah, don't be shy. <laughs> now we're going to shift our attention. So we were paying attention to our mind. Now we're going to pay attention to our body. Sometimes we get so caught up in the mind we forget we have a body. So notice in this moment the position you're sitting in. Notice the support of the chair beneath you. Your ability to just kind of relax into it. Notice any maybe sore or cranky spots in your body, <laughs> tension, tightness. We just stretched them all out, so we're probably feeling great. <laughs> Take a nice deep breath in and let it out. <sighs> and lastly, shift your attention to the simple fact that you are breathing. No need to change your breath. It's perfect as it is. Just watch a few cycles of your breath rise and fall. Take a deep inhale and let it out. Exhale. <sighs> and you can open your eyes. All right. So that was an experience of mindfulness. Now, I'm going to make the basic assumption that you guys are like me, and you lead busy lives, yeah? Long to-do lists, both at work and at home, lots going on. So why the heck would we take two of our very valuable minutes out of our day to do that kind of exercise? Well, for one, you are here, but your mind is elsewhere. <laughs> Sound familiar? Yeah, sometimes we're rushing through our day, right? Moving on to a different task or into a different space. And sure, our body has arrived, but often our mind is somewhere else. We're preoccupied maybe on something that happened this morning. Maybe we're worried or stressed or anxious about something that hasn't happened yet. Or, as Robin Sharma likes to say, I've learned that sometimes we need to slow down to speed up. Busy and faster doesn't always lead to bigger and better. So slowing down, this concept of slowing down can help us move forward into our next task, our next project with more intention, with more purpose, and as far as what we're all here for today, with more of our focus and our attention on safety. So mindfulness and this practice that we're going to explore for the next hour together 
is a really great way to help us boost our attentiveness to our tasks, reduce stress that's related to our job, sound good, <laughs> and overall be safer on the job. So I want to tell you a little bit about my story. You're probably like, who the heck is this woman? Why'd they choose her to be up here to teach us? Well, I want to share that with you guys. So my personal practice of mindfulness began about a decade ago. Crazy to think that as I was writing this, a decade. So I began practicing yoga and meditation. And at the same time as I was learning these techniques, I had a pretty standard traditional job. I was an event coordinator. In fact, I coordinated things just like this. <laughs> I coordinated conferences. I helped to put together a million dollar fundraising event. And I worked for a nonprofit, actually, not too far away from here, downtown Toronto, where we hosted what we called rock concerts for social change. So we'd literally take tens of thousands of youth. Have you guys heard of We Day? Yeah. So I helped put together several of those We Days. Whew. So my job was full on. <laughs> it was busy. It was demanding. But I found that my yoga and meditation practice brought me some balance. It's kind of like I got to put my feet up, you know, stretch out the body as we just did. <laughs> and the meditation practice is kind of like stretching out your mind or resting your mind. So as I continued to work my way up the career ladder, as we all do, my jobs got more demanding, the pressure got more intense, the stress started to elevate. But I now had this, what I like to call like a little toolbox or a little fanny pack, a little tool belt full of my mindfulness techniques and tricks. And I could use them when I was feeling overwhelmed, when maybe I had a busy day and I was trying to sleep and I felt like I couldn't shut my brain off. I had these techniques to lean into. And so it was like, again, I had this toolbox or this tool belt. So I was starting to bring my mindfulness practice to work with me. And it was helping. I was feeling less stressed. I was feeling more focused. I was feeling like I was making less mistakes. <laughs> and in a world where we dread Monday mornings, right, because we do, and we TGIF our life away, I was feeling more positive about work. I was actually more excited to go to work. I was having more fun. So my mindfulness practice was really helping me at work too. And the time came where I was working in conferences at this time. I was coordinating big conferences like this. And our department was getting a new VP. And I thought, all right, this new VP is going to come in. I'm going to be this great example for how to work more mindfully, more focused, less stressed. I probably don't have to tell you that I was quickly humbled. <laughs> So when he came into our department, it was pretty immediately clear that his definition of success and mine were vastly different. <laughs> in fact, the employees that he thought were probably the, you know, the best and working the hardest were the ones that were the most stressed. Running around like chickens with their head cut off on the verge of burnout and overwhelm, stress leave and sick leave. These were the employees that were doing a great job. And I was kind of taken aback. I thought, wait a second, no, I know that there's a better way. I have these techniques and tools that I can use. I, and I don't know that I really want to sacrifice my health and my happiness for my career when I know there's a better way. So I was kind of at a turning point. I was contemplating, you know, how do I want to move forward now in this career that I've built? And I was met with a clarity. Now, unfortunately for a lot of us, I'm sure you all can relate, often these clarities for us as human beings come in the form of challenge and loss. And that's exactly how mine showed up. So at the young age of 55, I lost my mom to breast cancer. And she was young, she was vibrant, and she had dreams, like we all do, right? Plans for our life. She had things she wanted to do on her vacations and in her retirement. And the clarity that I was met with in that moment was, I don't have time to waste. I don't have time to waste 
being stressed and overwhelmed about work when I know that there's a better way. I don't have time to waste five days out of my seven each week being in a place of negativity. And I don't have time to waste hating my job <laughs> and waiting for my weekends, my vacation, and my retirement. Because the truth is, you guys, every day is a gift. So in that moment, I knew that there was another path for me. And the awesome news was, I now had a message. I had a message that it doesn't have to be this way. That life is short. And that we can learn to live and work happier and safer using mindfulness. You know, the truth is often we move through our days on what we call autopilot, right? On cruise control. We just do things that way because we've always done them. We hate Mondays because that's what our culture says. We look forward and talk about our vacations because that's the only thing we really care about. But that is a choice. So we can choose to do that or we can choose to use some of the techniques that I have learned from great teachers and I now teach myself to be grateful and to enjoy literally every single moment. And the cool thing is the techniques that I teach are not just great ways to live and work happier, but they're also great ways to boost the performance of our business, boost creativity and innovation, productivity, focus, reduce stress. So my passion is now my purpose. And I really thank you for giving me the time to share that with you. As I said, I've been doing this work and these practices for about 10 years. And what I have noticed the most, and it is just booming and climbing and climbing lately, is that mindfulness is mainstream. Mm -hmm. It's no longer just for people who do yoga and, I don't know, meditate in yurts and burn incense and chant and do weird things like that. <laughs> it's for everybody. We see mindfulness in the healthcare industry. Nurses are practicing meditation as a way to reduce the stress and the anxiety of their work. Professional athletes, yes. We have NFL professional athletes meditating. So they are out there training their bodies, right? They're weightlifting, they're building their endurance. But they also recognize that mindset is huge. And lastly, right here in Canada, this company called New Brunswick Power, their employees have been practicing mindfulness as a way to increase their attentiveness to their tasks, to reduce the stress that's associated with their work, and to focus. And what they've seen since incorporating mindfulness is that they've had their best safety record in their history for three consecutive years. They've also seen medical aid events reduced by 97%, disabling events reduced by 99%, and work, workers' compensation board rates reduced by 60%. Pretty awesome. So how the heck do we practice mindfulness? <laughs> well, we did a brief little practice at the beginning of my presentation, and we'll do another. I work from a Mac. I apologize. It formats things so weird when I move to a, a PC. <laughs> so it's a mindfulness system minute. All right. So again, in a moment, I'm going to get you to close your eyes. And this is just to reduce distractions. Please know that if you'd prefer not to close your eyes, it's still possible to practice. But what you want to do is find one gazing point so your eyes aren't dancing around the room looking at what everybody's doing. I, I'm telling you, it's not interesting anyway. <laughs> Everyone's just got their eyes closed. So what we're going to do is practice mindfulness for a minute. I'm going to give you your instructions right now. So you'll close your eyes. When the bell dings to mark the beginning of the minute, all you're going to do is put your attention on your breath. Mindfulness is about our attention. Where is our attention? Where is our focus? So we're going to focus on our breathing. Simple breathing. But <laughs> you're going to probably take a breath, maybe two, maybe three. Something's going to happen. Something's going to distract you. What do you think it is? Just shout it out. What's going to distract you? A noise. Yeah, what else? 
someone say your mind? Your mind, yeah, what's in your mind? Thoughts, Thoughts. what are you thinking about? We're just curious. <laughs> Anything and everything, lady, <laughs> right? That's what she's thinking. What do you mean, what am I thinking about? Anything that there is. Yeah, so you might be thinking about what? Something that happened earlier this morning, something that's gonna happen this afternoon. You might be thinking I'm crazy, or you're bored, or you're hungry, or you're thirsty, or I could go on and on, right? Because the thoughts never stop. I teach a lot of people how to practice mindfulness. By the way, you can also call this meditation, brain training. And people are like, I can't meditate, I have way too many thoughts. No problem, I'm here to tell you, no problem, okay? So you're gonna focus on your breath. You'll have a thought, I promise you, you will. If you don't, find me later, you're my new teacher. You're gonna have a thought and all you have to do in that moment is direct your attention from that thought, because that's where it is in that moment, back to your breath. Our mind is moving at such an incredible pace that even stopping for a minute seems tor like torture. But I'm here to tell you, you continue to practice this and it's gonna feel like you get to put the metaphorical feet of your brain up. It becomes relaxing. And overall, what we're practicing when we're doing mindfulness, just like we just did, is becoming more focused and alert, right? Focused on our breath and alert to what's going on around us. Utilities companies say that actually 90% of accidents happen on beautiful, sunny days. Not when there's a big lightning storm. Because this is exactly when our minds are focused and alert. And workers are aware of potential accidents that could happen. So we're developing a focused and alert mind and this is gonna help us to identify potential risks and hazards in our environment. Now, why aren't we already focused and alert? What's the opposite of that? Distracted. We're often distracted. So why are we so distracted? Well, one of the reasons is that we're doing what this guy up here in this little cartoon is doing. Anybody, what's he up to? Juggling a bunch of things. What do we call that? Thank you. That was beautiful, like a coral thing, multitasking. Does anybody think they're, great, they're a great multitasker? Come on, I know there's some of you in the, in the job interview, I'm great at multitasking. I'm very detail-oriented. Mm -hmm. All right, so I have a bit of bad news. Bit of bad news, bit of good news. Bad news is multitasking is impossible for the human brain. Dang. It is a computer-derived term. And it's based on the fact that computers have multiple processors, kind of like they have multiple brains. How many do we have again? How many? I think I might have two, but how many do you guys have? No. <laughs> we all only have one brain. So when we say, I am a great multitasker, all we're saying is that I am switching tasks rapidly through my day. <laughs> right? Studies show we are 40% less productive. Just let that land for a second. 40% less productive when you multitask. Think of those days you have to stay late at the office or late at work. Hmm, what if I stopped multitasking? Might I be done earlier? Multitasking increases our chances of making a mistake. I just want to share a little personal story with you about this one time I was making uh, a curry for dinner and it was, you know, cooking away on the stove and I just thought, you know, why don't I just check my phone? Because why not? Multitasking. <laughs> my dinner boiled over. <laughs> Made a huge mess burned, definitely made me 40% less productive because I had to go and start all over again. I had to do the task twice. And I think we can all think of a time when this has happened. 99% of accidents are totally preventable, just like the great coconut curry debacle of 2017. So we're less productive. Research is also showing us that we are more stressed when we multitask. Think about it, you're juggling all these, this ta all these tasks your mind is so keenly aware of how many things you're trying to get done, but you're not really spending enough dedicated time on any one thing to complete it. That sounds pretty darn overwhelming to me. And the level of impairment, I just wanna really hit this home for you guys, the level of impairment we're under when we multitask. Studies have been done of people switching tasks, and tasks rapidly during their day. Their IQ drops 10 points 
which is the equivalent to losing an entire night of sleep and trying to do whatever you're, you're doing. Or, as you guys spent a lot of time focusing on yesterday, it's the equivalent to smoking marijuana and trying to do your job or your task. A 10 point drop in your IQ. So multitasking is essentially the opposite of mindfulness. Okay, so I share this just to show a stark contrast. We know the level of impairment we're under when we're trying to check our device and do anything else. Whether it's walking and tripping or people getting, you know, literally getting hit by vehicles because they're on their phone. It's illegal to drive and be on our phone. You can even think of a time when you were having a conversation with somebody and you were on your phone. You have no clue what they just said, right? So, Again, multitasking is the opposite of mindfulness. We want to avoid it as much as we can. Instead of juggling a bunch of tasks, we want to focus our attention, like we did on our breath, on one thing at one time. So what mindfulness is at the end of the day is present moment attention. It's giving ordinary things your extraordinary attention. It's being engaged immediately in whatever it is that you're currently doing, whether you're listening to someone speak, whether you're typing an email, whether you're driving your car, you're fully present to what you're doing. And the reason this is so important is because it's the opposite to what our mind wants to do, as illustrated in my image here, right? The dog's being mindful. He's immediately engaged in his current activity, and he is loving life, probably. And the human, what's he up to? Just dwelling on all of these, you know, future and past things. His mind is essentially wandering from the present moment, and studies say that this happens to us 47% of the time. And overwhelmingly, you guys, we're way less happy, happy when we're doing that. We're way more happy and positive and vibrant with life when we're engaged in the present moment. So let's try it again. Ooh, the formatting worked this time. Yay, me. Okay, mindfulness minute. Second technique. We're going to do a couple techniques today. It's because we all learn a little differently. So please, after my presentation, choose the path of least resistance, which means choose the ac exercise or activity that I gave you that worked the best for you. All the other ones, leave them, leave, let them go, right? Okay, so this time, one more minute. Again, our focus is going to be our breath, but we're gonna add a counting method. This helps, I think counting gives our brain a little something more solid to focus on. If you found the breath a little bit like abstract to focus on, now you get some numbers. Quick assumption, you can all count to 10. Okay, great, great. Um, awesome, so focusing on the breath, as you inhale, you'll count silently in your mind, or else it'll just be a cacophony of noise. In your mind, inhale, you'll count one, exhale, inhale two, exhale. You're gonna get lost. The mind is gonna wander 47% of the time. You're gonna bring it back when it wanders. And there's no need to spend time wasted, wasting time figuring out what number you're on. Don't worry about it, go back and start at one. Okay? And the good news is, you guys, what we practice, we get better at. Sounds so basic, but sometimes as adults, we like don't want to try anything new, right? We're like in our little groove, these are the things I know. What you practice, you're gonna get better at. Okay? Any questions about this one? Counting the breath? All right. Setting my trusty timer. Did I see a question? No? Okay. <laughs> so closing your eyes, focusing on counting the breath, noticing distracting, distraction, and coming back. I want to share with you guys a story about how cultivating a deliberately calm mind is so essential for our safety. So some of you might have heard of this story. This is about the miracle on the Hudson, Captain Sully Sullenberger, who landed his passenger flight on the Hudson River. Yeah, have we heard about this before? I'm going to tell it to you over again. So. Maybe I'll tell it better than the first time you heard it. Um, <laughs> so essentially, this passenger flight flew from LaGuardia in New York, took off, 
Everything's good. They're climbing, climbing when they come across a big flock of Canada geese. Sorry, guys. <laughs> big flock of Canada geese that get sucked in, sounds really horrible, into the, both of their engines. And they lose power to both engines. Yikes, right? They're still climbing. They have not even, they, I don't even think they've been gone five minutes. So essentially, whole plane loses power. This passenger flight with, I think, over 200 people becomes a glider. <laughs> so Captain Sully, the pilot of this plane, has some decisions to make, has a small problem to solve. And he's in contact with the air traffic controller, and they're, you know, trying to figure out what's next. Okay, well, why don't you land at Teterboro Airport? It's about 10 miles away. Great, beautiful, everyone will be fine. He's, you know, of course, checking all of his controls and, and buttons and things that I know nothing of. And he's realizing that is not happening. We are not going to make it that far. So I want you to, for a moment, put yourself in his position and the kind of emotions that might be arising in this high-risk situation, right? We think about it, he'd be worried, first of all, for his own life, second of all, for all of his crew, and for the 200-plus passengers. That is, <laughs> that's probably, it's an understatement to say it is the correct situation to freak out in. <laughs> However, he was able to stay calm, calm, cool, and collected. And taking into, consi into consideration all of the elements of what was going on, he made the decision to land this passenger airplane in the middle of the winter, essentially, on the Hudson River. And the story ends well because everybody lived. So scientists have looked at people like Captain Sully and they've tried to figure out, you know, what is it that allows someone like Captain Sully to make a decision like that, a critical decision, in a harrowing moment, in a fearful moment, and save all those lives. So what they figured out is that people like Captain Sully have the ability to balance intense emotion with critical thought. Most of us are overwhelmed by our emotions. We'd feel fear and we'd just be right there in the fear. We might freeze, we might get really emotional and not be able to solve the problem. But Captain Sully and people like him are able to balance those two things. Intense fear, it's there, it's rising up in him, but he's able to set that aside for a moment and focus more on critical thinking and problem solving. And what scientists call this is metacognition. And it's just a fancy word to say thinking about thinking. This is exactly what we do when we meditate. We decide we're focusing on our breath, distractions come. And distractions might come, like we said, in, in the form of sounds, in the form of sensations in our body, in the form of thoughts, but maybe emotions too, right? And in an intense situation here where the risk is great for injury and for death, we can possibly, if we practice, be able to, for a moment, not put our attention on the emotion, knowing it's not going to serve the situation, and instead put our attention on solving the problem. So essentially, people like Captain Sully are able to stay calm in these situations because they've actually practiced it. When they're learning how to fly in the flight simulator, they put them through these kind of experiences. They don't just have smooth flights for their entire practicum, right? They teach them what to do when this happens. So we can actually practice staying calm and practice choosing where we want our focus to go in times of challenge, risk, and potential injury and even death. And how do we practice calm? Well, again, we come back to the practice of mindfulness, which is focused on the breath. So this gift here is just asking you to sync your breathing with that expanding and contracting shape. So you can do that right now. This is called stealth mindfulness. No one has to know you're doing it. <laughs> you can even find this. Save it on your desktop. Save the link on your phone. Go back to it when you need that moment of calm, that moment of space, that moment of mindfulness. So all this is is deep breathing. Seems pretty simple. 
but it actually comes to us from the thousands of year old science of yoga. And what the ancient, ancient yogis found to be true, now we know is scientifically true, when we deepen our breath, when we take fuller inhalations and exhalations, we help our body shift from what we call a fight or flight, a stress response, into the rest and digest response. And this is where we want to be most of the time. Mostly it feels good. That's what you'll notice off the top. But it's also a state in which our body boosts, it, boosts its immunity so we can fight infection and disease better. Our heart rate regulates in the rest and digest state. And, as it sounds, digest, we actually digest our food better. So you can be eating the healthiest diet in the world, but if you're constantly in a stressed out state, your body is not making use of those nutrients. So deep breathing, practicing calm. And in fact, in one workplace study using mindfulness, what they found was a 36% reduction in stress levels. Sounds pretty good. And I always like to put a little caveat on this. This isn't saying that someone experienced 36% less stressful events, right? Practicing meditation or mindfulness isn't like taking an eraser and just erasing all the hard things out of life. <laughs> it's not, not really like that. But again, it's a tool and a technique we can use so that the effects of the stressful situations in our life are not as big. And so that when we do encounter situations where there is a potential hazard, we can approach it with a calm mind instead of already being in a stressed out state and trying to handle that risk. So as we come toward the end of our time together today, I want to share with you guys a few practical tools, more practical tools, we've had a few minutes of practice, ways that you can incorporate mindfulness into your day that's going to help you focus on safety. <laughs> this one says do a body scan. <laughs> Do a body scan. So at the beginning of the presentation, we one of the three parts of the check-in, we did mind, body, breath. So body was the second one, and we just became aware of sensation in our body. Yeah? So you might take a minute during your day to scan through your body from head to toe and just notice what you're feeling. You might notice any sore or cranky spots in the body. And for so many of us, you know, I think probably once you get to 30, I think it is, I'm just trying to think of my experience, you start to feel pain pretty consistently in your body. <laughs> so many people deal with pain, back pain, right? Probably the most common. And those who deal with back pain specifically know that it can be incredibly distracting. So when you take that moment to do a body scan, you might notice feelings of you know, tension, you might notice your back pain flaring up, if you suffer from migraines, you might notice a migraine coming on. And when you notice these things, if they're quite intense, you might choose to not move into a task that's, gonna, that's going to need your intense concentration in order to be safe, right? You're probably gonna avoid those tasks that are a little bit riskier because you know you're not as focused, or you're gonna take a minute to actually cultivate some focus so you can be fully present. You know, so many people deal with chronic injury. Chronic injury is due to repetitive movement, stress, and sometimes poor setups in your workspace. So I can't help but think, if we all did a body scan once or twice a day, we might notice before something becomes chronic. We might notice it when it's a little pinch, a little pain, and we go, hmm, what's that? Maybe I should change the way I'm moving. Maybe I should change my work setup so this doesn't escalate. Yeah? So a body scan. Second is starting the day with intention. So a lot of, I know a lot of manual labor, laborers, physical laborers, my husband works in a streets department for a municipality, you know, they gather together at the beginning of their day to talk through what's going on, you know, the plan for the day. So this is a perfect moment for them all to set an intention for the day. Maybe it's just as simple as saying, you know what, guys, we're going to have a really safe day today. We're going to keep our attention focused and alert on potential hazards, right? We're going to keep our thinking brain, our critical brain online. 
Maybe you kick off the shift with a short mindfulness exercise like we've done already. A minute, right? Short period of time, we all have a minute. Getting ready for the next day. <laughs> I know this well because like I said, I flew in late last night. Getting a good sleep <laughs> can really not be underestimated for how we move forward the next day. Safe and focused on safety and being alert and calm, right? However, we have so many people who deal with things like insomnia and sleep disturbances, yeah? And as I shared with you before, our brain gets better at what we practice. So this is good news if we're practicing things that we want to cultivate in our brain. The bad news is if you have sleep disturbances, you're likely spending more time worrying about falling asleep than you are actually falling asleep. So unfortunately, your brain's getting better at that. But good news, we could maybe incorporate a guided meditation or a guided mindfulness exercise when we go to sleep, listening to something that's relaxing. It's going to calm our central nervous system. It's going to reduce our anxiety and hopefully train our brain to fall asleep a little faster. <laughs> and lastly, focus on your senses, sensory organs. So our senses are the way we take in the world around us. And this is also so for taking in potential hazards and risks and being aware of our surroundings. So maybe you do a one minute mindfulness exercise where you focus on one of your senses. What do I see? What do I hear? What do I smell? Right? So maybe you're cultivating the sense of sound. You know, as I said, my husband works on a streets department. Sometimes they block off sections of the road to do some work. Sense of sound would be really important to him. What if he hears a car coming where they shouldn't be? He can be aware of that risk before it turns into an accident. Or his sense of sight. If you work with uh, chemicals, your sense of smell. Maybe you smell that potential leak before, again, it exacerbates to the point of I have some tips and suggestions as we come to the end of the presentation. If any of this has landed with you and you're like, yes, I want those benefits and yes, I want to be more safe and practice meditation. And